I want to encourage you. I, I, I brought a, a, a handout this morning back on that table. And I really would like for you to pick up one of them and take it home with you and study it. There's no sense in me doing all the studying here. And, and so uh, this section of Scripture today has been discussed for thousands of years, 2,000 at least. And so we can't do it justice in, in 30 minutes. And so I want you to take that. It's, it, it's some contextual insights from, from Bob Utley. And, and just take it. It's just one sheet, front and back, and, and, and go through that so that you'll understand what we're talking about this morning. I, I mean, this is a, uh, it's something that's been fussed about for, for ages. And so just, uh, just take it and, and uh, work through it, and, and I think you'll, you'll be blessed for it. So when James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 this morning, someone has said that faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you sure can see the results. <laughs> now, that's a, that's a truism there, isn't it? You know, uh, folks, results, that's the main theme throughout the book of James, is results. Uh, James is, uh, you know, we can boil it down to that one word, and, and real faith results in good works. See, the works that, that we need to be doing, God, nowhere does James explain it better than in, in this passage right here in 14 through 26. And this passage of Scripture, it forces us to answer the question, if you say you believe like you should, why do you behave like you shouldn't? Now, James is tough on us, guys. We know that. I mean, he, he holds no punches and... And, uh, but yet, <clears throat> you remember Martin Luther, he argued so much about this faith thing. And, and, and in the book of James, was, was so, he was so incensed with what James wrote that he, he called this. He said, James' book is a veritable straw epistle that should be thrown into the Rhine River. So he suggested that the book of James in, the, in this Bible should be thrown into the Rhine River. Now, that's Martin Luther, because Martin Luther was the one that nailed those things to the door of the church and simply said that, you know, faith is what brings one to salvation. You can't work your way there, is what, what he was saying. Now, <clears throat> so what is the central idea of, of these verses this morning, guys? One is it that, is it, uh, it, it's faith alone. And, and one answer may be, if we looked at this, is we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Now, James 2, 14 through 17. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one, you, one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Now, one of the things we understand uh, about these verses is, is that everything that, that we're doing this morning Everything that's been said in James before this points to this. And everything we're going to read about this in book of James after this points back to this right here. This is the central point of the entire book. Now, I, I know I've been hard on you all this time. And James has been hard on us. So rather than, you know, when, when I'm talking about what James says here, just, just think I'm talking to Tommy instead of you. So... Guys, James's question is like asking someone, why do you carry around a driver's license if you can't actually drive? That's, that's essentially what he's saying. You people may be called Christian, claim the faith, but they're, they're genuine results in what they claim 
to be true. Verse 1. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at, no, verse 14. I, I looked at this verse. And what but has faith, uh, this, can that faith save him? I looked at every resource I have, which is numerous. Uh, and because I, I just was confused about that a little bit, can that faith save one? And a number of them add a word. Can that kind of faith save one? Can that kind of faith? Or can such faith save one? And it's the quality of faith that James is talking about, folks. It's, it's the quality of faith. A, a faith that, that produces no fruit has no quality. Now, grammatically, uh, this question he asks, can, can that faith save one, uh, expects a no answer. It, it just they say, no, it can't. Now, uh, James concludes that, that faith without works is of no use. You know, and, you know, I, I think we can all say, what? Uh, but do the, do the work back there on that handout. James said it's no profit to God if there's no works. He says there's no profit to the church. There's no profit to the individual. If you don't use what you've given and got in salvation itself. Now, the CSB study Bible puts it this way. Can the faith that does not express itself in good works be a saving faith? Now, the answer, the answer uh, they say is no. Now, my, my first thought was, well, take that up with a thief on the cross. I, you know, uh, I don't understand all of this, guys. I, I assure you of that. But we have to understand what they're saying, what they're saying. Now, biblical faith consists of at least three different things. One of them is doctrine. And we find that in 1 John 4 and Jude 3 and Jude 20. Now, it, it also talks about a personal relationship and a commitment to Jesus. And then it, it consists of a godly lifestyle. And that's in James and 1 John, a godly lifestyle. See, all three aspects are involved in, in genuine, mature faith. Yeah. It, it could be that the people James was writing to, he was writing to Jews that had been dispersed and, and who had rid themselves of the idea of the faith of the works involved in salvation. They just said, okay, if... If works don't count, then let's don't do any of them. Uh, that's what was in their mindset, he thinks. that uh, See, they had embraced that notion. If righteousness had no part in salvation, then we, we consider them unnecessary. Maybe so. But they had reduced faith to the mere mental assent to the facts of Christ. And, and so, and, and then he, James goes, he follows this up with a very practical thing now. And now he said now, I said it, faith without works uh, is dead. Now, let me show you what that means. He says this. <clears throat> the needy, James talked about, have genuine needs. No question about this, guys. But it's, it's not just about throwing a few dollars to your favorite charity. That's not what he's talking about. He, in the USA Today, I, I think it's a, it's a fair statement that a good number of needy, they have cable TV, they have air conditioning, they have, a, they have an iPhone, they have all of these things. What James is talking about are needy. They, many need food, and many need clothing. Uh, many have not even the basics of life. And many are in dire need. If you've never worked around the Benevolence Committee, you need to do that one time. And you will then understand what needs are. Now, they're, they're mixed. They're a mixture, but you see, you see the real needy. And instead of the meeting the need, what do we do? We say, go in peace and be warmed. Now, we add to that, oh, we'll be praying for you while you're doing that. Folks, this is a reality. This is what James is. is. Uh, let me put it in Deer Park English, if you would. Suppose in your connection group, 
uh, someone lost his job and he can't pay for uh, for school clothes for his family. And but instead of opening your hands to to your brother, you you pat him on the back and say, "We'll be praying for you in this trial you're going through." And this is exactly what James is saying. What good is that? It does nothing. Put yourself in another's place. An unexpected illness hits your family and medical bills pile up and it makes it difficult to stay afloat in this world. And instead of tapping into the benevolence fund of the church, the pastor sends him a note card that says this, God calls it all things to work together for good to those who love God. Now, I know some pastors, one of them sitting over here, would never, you'd never get a, a note like that from him. But folks, I hope, and I don't think we'd get a note like that from ours either. But I'm telling you, that's a reality. That, that's what we do. In each case, we see a specific need, and we have an ability to meet that need, but we useless. It's a dead response that we can't do it. We don't do it. This is what James is talking about. The whole reality of this works that he's talking about. Works results from that. See, without faith, without results, I mean, faith like this is dead. First uh, John 3, 17. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? I mean... I didn't make that up, guys. That's, that's 1 John 3, 17. That's the world we live in, guys. Genuine, and in and, and, and verse 18, you know, but genuine faith is not invisible either. It's, it's on display, actually, if you will, genuine faith. There's, a, there's another kind of false faith out there, guys. It's, it's called the religious intellectual. It's the skeptic out there that... Uh, they boast all kinds of scientific and historical credentials and all that. They want to talk about religion and as a social, a psychological, philosophical opinions. They remain objective, analyzing and reinterpreting faith for the modern mind. But the truth is, they don't actually have faith. And to make matters worse, they aren't really interested in getting it either. Folks, you can... You can reinterpret all you want to out of this, but this is God's living word. Scripture tells us it's alive, and it feeds us what we need to be fed. And he goes on to say that, that studying the idea of God, analyzing our belief system, is light years away from receiving the Lord Jesus by authentic faith and living out that faith in our lives, in our daily walk. Verse 23 and following. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. James selects two extremes to make his point two extremes of people one of them abraham the other rahab abraham is the father of the hebrews rahab is a gentile prostitute abraham a man of power and respect rahab a woman of ill repute Abraham, the recipient of God's promise. Rahab, a breaker of God's moral laws. God, two people that's polar opposites. And James pulls him into this equation. And he says this, every Christian find ourselves somewhere between Abraham and Rahab. Somewhere in that stretch from Abraham to Rahab, we're going to all fit in there somewhere. Now, now, I hope that, that, that we uh, are fit in there because that means we know the Lord if we do. But Hebrews eleven seventeen says this, By faith, Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac. Hebrews eleven thirty one, 31, 
By faith, Rahab welcomed the spies in peace. Now, see, Rahab's theology was pretty simple, and, and, but her faith was great. She had known what was going on with those Israelites. And now listen, we, uh, in our world, uh, I mean, we melted in fear when we saw what your God had done. So Abraham said, look, they've got something going for them. And it's something that we don't have going for us, and that's an almighty God. We saw them how they, that they'd opened a part of the Red Sea. They had done all of those things. And it, and, but she didn't know much, but what she knew determined her actions. Now, and in verse 19, James actually drops, uh, he drops another bomb on her. So, and, and he said, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. <laughs> Yeah, it, monotheism was the first test of Judaism. In other words, you know what Scripture says way back there in Scripture? It said, You'll have, you shall have no other God before me. The Lord God is one. You see, demons know who Jesus is. Demons know and believe in monotheism. They know all about that. And what do they do? They shudder. They shake. Simply because they'd seen the exorcism Jesus had done. They knew Jesus could call them out of that body and send them into the abyss, which they didn't want to go. So this is what, he, this is what we, we see here. And when he talks about the, even the demons know that, guys. Now, starting with verse 21 begins this controversy. In verse 21 through 24, we read this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. Paul in Romans 3.28 says this, and here's the controversy. It said, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So that's the whole controversy. Now, we also know that when, when Paul came back to Jerusalem, we've studied, I think, this before, but uh, James defended Paul in everything that he said. He defended him and said, This man is good. He knows what he's doing. You see, Paul is looking at the root of, the root of salvation, the faith that brings us to know Christ, to believe. James is looking at the fruit, the fruit of salvation. At salvation, this, this root is planted, and once it's planted, our lives will then bear fruit. Someone put it this way, it's not faith and works that save a man. It's not faith or works that save a man. It is faith that works. Faith that works. See, nowhere does Paul and James argue the core of salvation. When, when, you, when you study this, I think you'll, you'll come to that conclusion also. Also, see, James is pointing out that a mere intellectual acceptance of Christ does not lead to salvation. A mere intellectual, you know that. Uh, let me give you a, a brief testimony here uh, of my friend Mario Fuentes. Uh, long story short, Mario walked across the Rio Grande and came to Texas. He went through the legal process. He became a citizen, and he showed up at my door one day, and I hired him. And he was a degreed engineer from the University of Mexico. And I can't tell you how Mario was rough and still uh, crude in some ways. And, but uh, he turned out to be a great guy. He turned out to be a great worker, very intelligent person. He fixed so many cars for the singles when we were back to working there. He was a good mechanic, too. But I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with Mario and, and explained the gospel the best I could to him. 
And being an engineer, you know, engineers, if you're an engineer, I apologize ahead of time. See, they have to, they have to know. How, did, how does this work? They, they just have to know things. It's, it's so Mario being an engineer, he would look at me funny. And, and then I, I finally, the last time I saw him, Mario is retired now and moved back to Mexico. And the last time I sat down with him, I turned to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I said, Mario, read that to me. Just the first sentence. And he said, in the beginning, God. I said, Mario, can you get past that point right there? Can, can you understand there is a higher power? There's someone watching over us. And he says, well, I can. <laughs> because it doesn't work the other way. He had an intellectual understanding of God. But he just said it don't work the other way. And he's right. It doesn't work the other way if you look the other way. I still pray for Mario. He's in Mexico now and bought him a farm down there trying to be a farmer. And uh, he keeps t telling me to come to see him. And I'm, I told him maybe one day I'll come to see him. Mario is a good man, though. He just needs to know Christ. And you see, true faith brings out good works, guys. And the two are inseparable. Good works flow from a living faith. Look around you in this department. You're part of that living faith. And good works flow from this department. I mean, you could write them down. You can name them. And, uh, and that's why it, it seemed like we're, we're up here talking to the choir again. And You know what? We should get up every morning, every morning, and ask God what he wants us to do today. Can you, can you imagine what this world would be if we just got up doing that? How can I help? What can I do, God? See, all those actions that we do, they don't win us brownie points, God. That's not the point. They don't win us brownie points. They do serve as proof that we have faith, though. When Abraham offered Isaac up on that mountain there, it proved his faith because he was serious when he said, I'll obey you, God. We do a disservice when we tell a new believer to say a simple prayer and walk down the aisle and talk to the preacher. When we tell them that's all that's required of us to be a follower of Christ. That's pretty much what I was told. And I realized several years later, hey, there's something to this being a Christian we have to we have to do certain things in order to please God folks I just I, I, I hope we would change that I'm on a uh, I, I hope I don't intend it I thought about not using this but it's it's I don't want it to be disrespectful in a way but it's a third person Jesus talking and just just listen to what th this person had in mind he goes on to say this is Jesus supposedly speaking Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. This is, this is concluding the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, I'm glad you could attend today's Sermon on the Mount. Matthew will make copies of his notes and distribute them at a later date. However, if you don't apply what you've heard today, you might as well have stayed at home. Even though I'm Jesus, hearing me preach won't help you. But applying what you heard today will preserve and establish you. Very true stuff right there, guys. What we hear and what we read in this book will establish our proof that we have faith in a living God. Father Jesus, we thank you this morning for your, your blessed forgiveness of sin in our lives. Putting us a spot in eternity to be with you and Lord we're no longer fearful of death Lord we thank you for the way that you love on us the way that you provide things for us to, to do these works with Lord we could do so much more we need to be about your work in doing these works James is right 
we have bedrock faith that brought us to you. And by these works, we're going to show that the faith is real. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks.